again everybody and welcome back to another beautiful sunny day in the north of England today. I'm in St Helens, the wonderful town of St Helens. And I'm looking at this, this is the Sankey Canal or the St Helens Canal. And it claims to be uh, the oldest industrial age canal in England, older than the Bridgewater Canal. Um, but it's not all here anymore, unlike the Bridgewater. It's not all in water, a lot of it's disappeared, a lot of it's just completely been built over. So what I want to do today is follow it from end to end, um, from where it started uh, in St Helens, here, all the way down to Widnes, um, and take in some of that history, learn some of that history, but also see what's left, see what's left uh, of this wonderful uh, industrial age canal. The Sankey Canal was opened in the 1750s, when it was becoming quite common for rivers around the country to be made navigable for large cargo boats, thus opening up faster transport links for industry and trade. The original proposal was to make the largest waterway in the area, the Little Sankey Brook, navigable for boats travelling from St Helens down to the River Mersey. Initially, it was a straightforward application to widen and deepen the brook, but in the end became a completely separate canal along most of its length. The grandmother of all industrial canals. Opened in 1757, the canal was built so that coal from the Haydock collieries could be transported to Liverpool via the Mersey. The canal also carried a lot of iron ore and corn. The engineers behind the Sankey Canal were Henry Berry and William Taylor. Berry had previously worked on the Newry Canal between Loch Nee and the Irish Sea a whole 15 years before. The Northern Irish one technically the oldest canal in the British Isles. When it came to the Sankey, the plan had its start just to the east of St Helens, at somewhere called Broad Oak, an arc down to here, where it entered the Mersey. Three short branches were also part of the parliamentary petition, here at Blackbrook, here at Gerrard's Bridge, and here at Ravenhead. And the canal was extended later to Fiddler's Ferry, and then Widnes, which I'll get to later on. For now though, I want to look at the first half of the canal, from St Helens to Warrington, to follow its course and see what's left of it today. So St Helens was full of glassworks, plate glasswork, vast, uh, taking up vast areas next to the canal and in the city, in the town centre. Um, and this part of the canal, as you can see, is still fed with water, or it's still water being discharged into this bit of the canal. This bit of the canal was known as the Hotties uh, because of all the hot water being discharged from the industrial works around here. The furthest point the canal ever reached was at the end of the Raven Head branch, here at the bottom of what is today Canal Street, and next to the sheet glass works, today Pilkington's factory. It then turned eastwards where the shopping centre is, and ran for a short period around the town centre where today it's still in water. The World of Glass Museum here celebrates the town's glass blowing heritage. Now it's hard to tell at the moment, but just there was a small branch arm of the canal called the Sutton Arm and it went just a short distance directly southwards to some coal pits. Um, if I swing about this way, where the geese are, you might be able to see this bridge in the background. Um, this is a new bridge. This canal was built with Mersey flatboats in mind, so Mersey flats had very, very tall sails. Uh, remember this is the 18th century, the mid 18th century. So very, very tall sailed boats. So all the bridges which crossed it uh, were built as swing bridges to get out of the way of these boats. Um, this one is a new, fairly new um, bridge and it doesn't swing because the council or whoever built this bridge didn't have the foresight to think that maybe if this was going to be opened up again as a canal and restored properly, that boats wouldn't be able to get under there, you'd need another swing bridge. So if you're going to open this up, that's the first obstacle, you're going to have to knock that bridge down. Anyway, uh, let's crack on and let's get to the, um, the new old locks, <laughs> the new double locks. <laughs> Today St Helens is famous for several things. This is rugby land of course, but it was also a nationally important centre for glass production, as well as a regionally important centre for coal mining. The canal helped the town grow massively, and with each new road built to accommodate this expansion, swing bridges had to be installed across the canal. And when the railways came some 80 years later, they also had to cross using swing bridges. Today, large parts of the canal are still in water, but cut off by infilled sections. This bridge here was originally just flat beamed. The arch is built later to strengthen the bridge. This whole restored section of the canal ends at this point, where another swing bridge would have been.
Right, so this is the new double lock and it was built in 1770. Um, and it's the new double lock because there was an old double lock already in place further down the canal. This new double lock took the canal up into the town centre of St Helens. So now I'm, I'm leaving the town centre if I keep following it this way. So what is a double lock? Well, a double lock is two locks side by side that actually share a lock gate in the middle, this one here, so that the water directly um, goes from one chamber into the next without any sort of uh, break in, in, in the middle there. Um, so this one is the newer one, 1770 though still, it's quite old. Uh, whereas the, the older one is further along, we'll see that later. So these were some of the first um, multi-use, uh, multi-sequential locks um, on canals anywhere. Um, so yes. So this lock was restored in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, not that you can tell today. Uh, it's not very, it's not fared very well in the last 30 years. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's worth having a look at. Let's see what we can see. Right, so because this lock was restored, um, a lot of what you can see now is, is from the late 80s, early 90s, the brickwork over there. Um, and the lock itself, it's pretty much useless. It's just full of rubbish. Um, but if we walk up here, a bit further up, you can see, um, past the old gate here, um, you can see some of the original stonework over there. But don't fall in. Um, some of the original stonework over there, which opened out into this small basin just over here, which is all overgrown and swampy. Um, but yeah, it won't take much to restore this canal um, in this section where I am now. Town centre is a bit more tricky, but it's a bit of a section now. Yeah, it won't take much to do it properly. Right, so just below the locks, you come to this T-junction, which is just here. The locks are that way, the town centre is that way. So it came down here, and then you've got this line. This behind me is a line of a branch arm that went west for a quarter of a mile or so to a small basin. Not very significant. The rest of the canal went in this direction, which is what I'll be following now. Now it looks, the water's flowing in here. It looks like a natural brook, a natural waterway. That's because it kind of, it's kind of been reclaimed a little bit as it's been infilled and as it's kind of lost its canalness, its canal identity, it has become a bit of a natural waterway. So the water is flowing quickly uh, down this bit here. So as you can see, you can't go down this footpath um, because they're repairing it. But if I go over here near the fence, you might be able to hear down that grid, water flowing. Now that is the actual brook. Now the brook and the canal kind of ran next to each other for a little bit. The brook went under the canal um, and wiggled on that side over there for a bit off and on at the surface. The canal dominated the valley really. Um, but the brook still is underground and it still goes under here. Um, it's just some of it seeps into the canal here and we get this movement of water. So it's kind of half canal, half brook at the moment, this bit. The Rainford flowed into the Sankey Brook, which is the first time on the journey that we actually come close to the brook the canal is named after. Today, the canal actually disappears beneath roads and this playing field. Right, so we lost the canal a bit there because of all the road and uh, the, the buildings and the school and stuff. But now we've come to this rugby club and the line of the canal actually came where them people are and a straight line over to where you can see that bridge there. Um, so the line of the canal has completely been lost um, here, but you can still walk along it if you like. So the canal came down here and then it went that way and to this, this is the old double lock which I mentioned before, but it also went this way. This is a branch line which heads for a little way to the north, the Black Brook branch. And we're going to follow that now to a little basin at the end and see what we can find.
The Black Brook branch came to this wharf here, where a mineral railway from the colliery came to meet it. There was also a small slitting mill in the area, built in 1773. So we've come at last to the old double locks, the old double locks, uh, as opposed to the new double locks we saw earlier. Now this set was built in 1756, so about 13 or 14 years before the new double locks. Now with the Sankey Canal being the oldest industrial age canal in, in England, um, this of course is the first ever lock staircase in England. The first ever lock staircase in England. Two chambers, a double chamber like before, two chambers separated uh, sharing a gate in the middle and now of course there are, there are industrial age canals in France before there were in England so it's not the first lock staircase in the world but it is the first one in England and that's just wonderful unfortunately it's not here anymore um, it's been replaced by this cascading water feature uh, which is a bit of a shame it would have been nice to see it preserved um, but yeah very important feature on the canal there was a, a railway spring swing bridge on the top lock up there a pedestrian swing bridge lower down as well but they they both gone as well uh, but yeah wonderful the line of the canal now follows side by side with a brook past the large park colliery and through open countryside to newtonley willows Now the nearby Bridgewater Canal is often cited as the first of the industrial age in mainland Britain because it follows no natural watercourses and is definitely an artificial channel from end to end. The Sankey was built with the aim of making the brook navigable for boats and so loses the distinction of being a separate canal. But it is a separate canal, almost its entire length running separate to the natural watercourse. And though today the waters are both intermingled here and there, there's still no doubt that the Sankey is a true canal, the first in Britain. Right, so the Sankey Brook is down there, and that is kind of a flooded field over there. Beautiful sunshine, but look at that over there, that high banking. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. I think we'll find out very soon. Right, so now I'm outside Newtonley Willows and this is Newton Common Locks and it's one of the original locks on the canal, built in 1775. This is actually um, a reconstruction, it, it was um, rebuilt in 1889. This is what you're looking at now, the footprint of an 1889 rebuild. Um, but of course it's not here anymore, it's been infilled. So the last barges came through here in about 1919 and then it fell into dereliction and was neglected and abandoned. And in the, in the 1970s, the council filled it in and left what we see today. Um, so yes, but this is still one of the, the first locks on one of the first canals in Britain. So um, it's just just there, this footprint's so tantalizing that it remains like this, but it's, it's not in water. And so we've come at last to the Sankey Viaduct, this mighty construction behind me, built in 1830 to carry the Liverpool to Manchester Railway across this valley, across the Sankey Brook and across the Sankey Canal, which this path here follows the line of. So the canal went that way under that archway there. The brook is over there, uh, just in the undergrowth over there. Um, now the, the viaduct was built um, in an architectural style drawing on canal aqueducts because that was the available technology at the time. That's all people knew. And George Stevenson decided to build a viaduct here instead of what other options, I don't know what other options he would have had, but he decided to go for the viaduct um, because of the Mersey flat boats, which I mentioned before, with the huge tall sails needed to keep going down the canal. And so he needed that clearance of the railway line crossing those sailboats. So that is why it's high up there, 20 odd meters above the ground. Um, yes, making this the world's first railway viaduct. Amazing, the world's first railway viaduct crossing 
the England's first industrial age canal. Quite a significant point. <laughs> Now of course this viaduct is still in use, it's still the Liverpool Manchester Railway, it's still the Liverpool to Manchester Railway and it's still in use, you might even see a, a train go past in the background while I'm waffling on a little bit, killing time but uh, yes it's still in use and the trains today are much heavier than the, the trains that it was built for in 1830 so it just goes to show the design, the um, ingenuity uh, the ingenious um, engineering <laughs> behind it all, George Stevenson's uh, amazing Sankey Viaduct. Still propping up the railway today and still doing it in a fantastic way as well. A short distance south of the viaduct the canal is back in water. Soon enough though the canal disappears again by these fields. Its line is still traced by the footpath I'm following. Then there's some sad remains of Winwick Lock left remaining, rotting away year by year in the shadow of the motorway. Next is Winwick Quay which was once a hive of canal activity. A large maintenance yard contained a wood and metal workshop where key parts of the canal infrastructure were made, including timber bridges, gates and parts for boats at the Iron Forge. The building here today is from the 1840s. There's also a large crane here lifting boats from the yard and into the canal, and a small railway bringing coal. This was also a good spot for horses to rest and recuperate as they hauled the boats along the canal. There was also a dry dock here, which could be drained for boats to be repaired. Further down is the remains of Hume Lock, and the remains of the lock keeper's cottage, which was excavated and restored a little, though today it's quite overgrown. Looking at the foundations of the old cottage, it's easy to imagine what this place would have been like in the deep dark winter cold, with a fire on the hearth and a pot of boiling water on the stove. Long before the motorway and the arrival of this big industrial estate, this was bleak, open country in the middle of the two towns. Just beyond the lock, the brook crosses beneath the canal and a sluice gate remains which was open to prevent flooding. However, ironically, I couldn't get anywhere near it because the whole area itself had become deluged with flood water thanks to heavy recent rains. So as the canal and brook wind their way through Warrington Town, we've still got a long way to go until we discover its original end. Down here, where the brook met the River Mersey at Sankey Bridges. But we'll pick that up in the next video and continue to follow the canal along its final two extensions, all the way to Fiddler's Ferry and then Widness. Thanks so much for watching everybody and I'll see you in the next one.